Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ian Mannion, and uh, I'm on behalf of the National Infant, Child, and Youth Mental Health Consortium, and my co-chair Kelly Anderson. We'd like to welcome you to our inaugural webinar. Uh, we're thrilled to have over 150 registrants participating today, and because this is our inaugural webinar, I'm going to ask for you to be patient for any technological difficulties that we encounter along the way. Uh, although many of you are, are already members of the National Infant, Child and Youth Mental Health Consortium, uh, we appreciate they, that uh, for others this is your, actually your first contact with what is rapidly becoming a very strong voice for all stakeholders in child and youth mental health in Canada. Uh, during today's session we'll be providing you with a bit of background information regarding the consortium. Following this, there will be a presentation on an important funding opportunity through the Institute of Human Development, Child and Youth Health at CIHR. And in that regard, we are very happy to have both Elizabeth Fowler and Andrea Smith join us uh, to present to you on that uh, initiative. After their presentation, we'll have the opportunity for an in-depth question and answer period, which will also include a discussion of the role that the consortium can play in facilitating and coordinating responses to this particular funding call. Now, what you'll find uh, during the, the webinar, during the presentations, everyone will actually be muted so we won't have any interference on the line. And when it comes uh, to the discussion period, we'll give you more details about how you'll be able to uh, lift up your hand and express your questions, whether it's either verbally or, or in, in writing, typing them out. Uh, so there's no denying that the time has come for Child and Youth Mental Health in Canada. It seems right now at or near the top of most groups' priority lists, regardless of the players, uh, where the players are, whether they're in health, education, child welfare, youth justice, or any other related sector. It's a conversation that is linking research and policy, and is also recognizing the all-important voices of youth, parents, families, and caregivers. Now, the consortium's roots can be traced back to the early days of this resurgence of child and youth mental health. Although many of you have dedicated your careers to this area of practice, research, and policy, it's really in the last six to seven years that the conversations have truly gone national. It's on everybody's radar, it's on everybody's lips, and it's a huge opportunity that we have to make sure we take full advantage of. In 2005, following such conversations with many people present on the webinar today, CAFC hosted a symposium on child and youth mental health at their inaugural conference in St. John's, Newfoundland. At that symposium, there was representation from service providers, from researchers, from parents and young people, and uh, at the time, Senator Michael Kirby was one of the key speakers. That was before the, found the formation of uh, the uh, Mental Health Commission of Canada. CAFC's commitment to keeping mental health as an integral part of all child and youth health has been evident in their annual conferences ever since. In 2007, it was explicitly recommend, re recommended from the conference in Montreal that a national network of partners committed to child and youth mental health across Canada be formed, and the result was the establishment of the National Infant, Child and Youth Mental Health Consortium. The uh, consortium is uh, 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 based really on the recognition that the collective work of partners from a variety of communities and sectors is vital if we're to achieve our mission and vision of ensuring that every child Infant, child, and youth thrives within their families and communities and has the opportunity to achieve their optimal mental health. The consortium actively champions the development and implementation of a cohesive national infant, child, and youth mental health plan. We do this by informing, supporting, facilitating, and mobilizing the collective work of our membership uh, organizations and our various stakeholders. The strength is really in our membership. Our uniqueness and strength comes from the breadth of our membership. Currently, we have strong representation from across the country at both an individual and organizational level. Uh, we are a forum for the voices of service providers, researchers, policymakers, advocates, youth, parents, and other carers. We work very closely with key national partners, such as the Mental Health Commission of Canada and its Child and Youth Advisory Committee, as well as the Canadian Institutes of Health Research among many other partners and stakeholders. Our goals are many, but all target the need to develop and maintain a strong, cohesive national focus on the importance of child and youth mental health for all Canadians. This includes, but it's not limited to, developing a common understanding and language for child and youth mental health across sectors. 
too often we've had different ways of talking about the issues, different barriers and rules and, and, and philosophies that sometimes impede our ability to have a truly national conversation across sectors. Promoting the monitoring of mental health status of Canadian infant child, uh, children and youth. Another goal is collaborating to share knowledge wherever it can impact practice, research and policy. Promoting the use of evidence from both research and practice in decision making at the individual, programmatic, organization and systemic level. Advocating for equitable access to acceptable, appropriate and effective mental health services for all young Canadians. Promoting the development of national standards of care across the full continuum uh, that include both targeted and integrated services with a commitment to meaningful and measurable outcomes. And when we talk about the full continuum, we're talking about promotion, prevention, early identification, intervention, and chronic care. Building collaborative research and education and training capacity across disciplines and across sectors. We recognize that we have huge strengths in our research, uh, researchers across Canada in this particular area. We also have gaps and our researchers are not necessarily all linked together so we can have cohesive efforts uh, for better outcomes. The consortium's uh, partnership with the Institute for Human Development, Child and Youth Health is but one example where our collective capacity and direct input has had a significant impact on, that, on a national initiative. We'd like to thank the various members of the consortium who contribute to the preparation of a background paper that has become an integral part of the opportunity that Elizabeth and Andrea will now be speaking to us about. Uh, I'd like to take this time to actually introduce our two colleagues from CIHR uh, who uh, are going to be speaking to you, to you directly today about uh, this initiative. Elizabeth Fowler is Assistant Director, Partnerships and International Relations for the Institute of Human Development, Child and Youth Health at CIHR. Elizabeth has close, uh, close to 20 years of experience in the healthcare field, primarily in the areas of policy, research, and patient access. Her work, uh, experience has been, uh, her work experience has been diverse, ranging from well-being related initiatives at a community organization to planning and implementing health advocacy campaigns. She has worked with a variety of not-for-profit groups across North America and Europe to promote strategic health policy initiatives with an emphasis on patient and consumer involvement in healthcare. Prior to her position at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, she worked as a consultant for World Health Advocacy, planning and implementing stakeholder campaigns, working in partnership, development and researching health policy papers and briefings. Elizabeth has also co-authored a number of published studies related to patient involvement in the healthcare system. She has also presented posters and given presentations at numerous conferences and symposia. Aside from her professional responsibilities, Elizabeth is a board member of the Canadian Organization of Rare Disorders. Uh, Andrea, Andrea Smith, is Manager Partnerships for Health System Improvement and Evidence on TAP programs at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Andrea, um, Andrea um, both programs, sorry, both programs focus on applied and policy relevant health systems and services research and take innovative approaches to supporting researchers and decision makers seeking to strengthen the Canadian healthcare system. In her previous role as Senior Advisor with the Knowledge Translation Branch, she acted as the lead on CHR's policy uh, on access to research outputs, playing an integral part in the launch of PubMed Central Canada, a digital repository of CHR-funded research publications. Prior to joining CHR, Andrea worked in the area of knowledge exchange and capacity development with the Canadian Health Services Research Foundation. So clearly we have two individuals who will be talking to us who have a wealth of experience and uh, will be presenting, I think it's uh, Elizabeth Firth first, uh, on a very important opportunity, I think, for all of us. So Elizabeth, take it away. Thank you very much, Ian. I'll try to live up to that introduction. Um, and thank you very much to CAFC and the National Infant, Child and Youth Mental Health Consortium for giving us this opportunity to talk about uh, our upcoming uh, funding opportunities and also for all the help that you've uh, given us in the creation of, of these opportunities so far as well. So I'd like to start just by giving a very brief, I promise I won't talk very long time, <laughs> on CIHR and on ITSI, uh, the Institute of Human Development, Child and Youth Health. 
Um, and then I'm going to talk about just basically how we got to the funding opportunity and the parameters that we're going to be outlining. And then finally, uh, a very brief discussion of the tools that we've decided to use in putting this funding opportunity forward. And I'm going to pass it over to Andrew to talk about the second tool in more depth, the, the FISI tool, the Partnership for Health System Improvement, because she really is the, the guru on that, um, that tool. So to, <laughs> sorry, my slide is a bit slow. Um, this is CIHR. We are um, made up of 13 institutes. It's, we just celebrated our 10-year anniversary. We grew out of the old uh, Medical Research Council. And it's um, virtual, so each institute is based in uh, a, the home research institution of the scientific director. So I'm talking to you today from McGill, which is where our scientific director, Dr. Michael Kramer, is based. And uh, it's snowing and uh, a bit scary looking outside there today. Um, but CIHR is the major federal agency responsible for funding health research in Canada. It funds about $800 million worth of research each year. And its goals include improving the health of Canadians, um, developing research excellence, and also translating the, the knowledge created into more effective health services and products and strengthening our healthcare system and improving the health of Canadians in general. So, um, how CIHR funds research is through two main methods. One is through the open competition, so this is investigator initiated, and this is 70% of CIHR's research funds goes to the open competition. Um, there are two open competitions a year, um, and uh, this is, you know, the best best and brightest ideas. Send us your applications, they'll be reviewed, and uh, the top um, applications are, are chosen. The second way is through strategic initiatives, which is um, developed by institutes and branches. And so this is the remaining 30% of, of our funds are, developed, are sent out through strategic initiatives. Um, and the institutes respond to the, the specific needs of their research communities and then develop tools um, for research that will <laughs> answer these needs. Um, so this, this little graphic is a... Is a my way of trying to explain what priority announcements are. So you see on the left-hand side, that's the open competition investigator initiative, the largest part of our funding. Then there's the strategic initiative, so very targeted opportunities. Uh, priority announcements really represent the bridge between the two. These are um, tools that uh, it, institutes can sort of attach their specific initiatives to. So it's a way that the institutes can expand how much money they can put towards a specific targeted initiative. So in this slide just talks a little bit about the growth of um, the CHR's budget and shows the, the breakdown between the open versus strategic. And the, the sort of main um, point that I wanted to make with this one is that you'll notice that the central strategic, the yellow portion, is, is growing pretty rapidly um, because uh, more institutes are, are starting to use more of these priority announcements. So CHR ITSI. Our main mission is to promote and support research that improves the health and development of mothers, infants, children, youth, and families in Canada and throughout the world, so moms and babies. And we have now four research priorities and four cross-cutting themes. We um, revamped the research priority areas a couple of years ago to align them more closely with CHR's overall direction. And so the current uh, funding opportunity that I'm going to talk to you about today relates to the development and mental health of children and youth as well as the cross-cutting theme of health services. So when we first started um, looking uh, at this initiative, um, we, the, the research that, that we found was, uh, I mean, it's a bit astonishing <laughs> at how how early uh, the onset of, of mental health illnesses appear, and then the complete lack of um, ability for children and youth and their families to gain access to these, um, these services. So only one in five Canadian children who need mental health services currently receive them. So 80% of our kids are, are not getting access to the help that they need, which as a mother of a young kid I, I find very scary because it, it's got to be scary to, to recognize that your child has a, a mental health issue to begin with and then not to be able to get the help that you need is um, quite distressing. So ITSI uh, <laughs> decided that it was going to try to help to do something about this. 
So we had um, in June 2010, we put together a two-day consensus workshop uh, in partnership with the Mental Health Commission of Canada, who has been a one wonderful partner with us on this initiative all the way through, and they have remained close uh, working partners with us um, through the creation of the writing of the funding opportunity as well. Um, so the participants, we wanted to make sure that they were a large cross-sector from um, different disciplines, so mothers and kids, service providers, professional associations. And the whole outcome, the purpose of the workshop was to talk about what are the needs and the gaps that could be filled by research and then what is the parameters of the funding opportunity that will, could potentially address some of these, some of these issues. So the outcome are um, that there are three main research areas that were identified by the participants. Uh, the first was um, wh what is the state of the knowledge in Canada right now? Because every single person, while they talked at great length about the issues within Canada, everyone also had these pockets of excellence. Everyone knew of a small program here or a model there, something innovative that was happening up in the north or within a small community um, that was particularly excellent and innovative. They said, so where are these <laughs> pockets of excellence? And then which ones can be expanded on? Which ones have research supporting the fact that they're effective? And which ones can be scaled up either geographically or uh, within a wider um, population? So the outcomes of this workshop were then crafted into the objectives for this, the specific funding tools that we're going to use. Um, and these objectives, and I'm going to just read through them because um, I think they're important, although number one and number three are quite similar, um, which are to identify key problems or key policy barriers uh, to that affect access to mental health services from children, for children and youth. Um, and based on the outcome of the background document that Ian alluded to earlier, we've changed the, we've added a bit of a, a modifier to identifying the barriers that Areas in general have been fairly well documented, so we are hoping that people will, when they make their applications, that they'll uh, look more into suggest strategies to overcome these barriers rather than just documenting them again. So, and also to identify what models exist in Canada and internationally that have been evaluated and have data pertinent to access. We are hoping that the researchers will help identify the fit between certain models which have evidence of improving access. Um, to identify which existing models can be scaled up and to identify innovative models and programs that have been developed but need to be evaluated. So those, those are the main objectives and the purpose of the funding opportunities to address these issues and to address them from a system service model. So looking at health services rather than clinical treatment perspective, um, focusing on specific interventions and discrete problems, we're hoping that it's more of a system service. Um, and for that reason, we've chosen the tools of knowledge synthesis and then this partnership for health systems improvement because the FISI grant really requires interaction with decision makers or end users uh, in the hopes that it will really be very applicable. Um, the knowledge synthesis grants obviously will be for those uh, that find out where are the pockets of excellence, what's happening within Canada. And we're launching these two priority announcements uh, for the June 2011 uh, open competition with a funding start date of uh, April 2012. So the knowledge synthesis tool, its main function is to strengthen knowledge translation by funding research syntheses that will help improve the health of Canadians and help create more effective health products and services and a strengthened health care system. And these um, grants are up worth up to $100,000 for one year. Obviously, if you don't need $100,000, you don't ask for it, but that's the maximum award for this grant. And then the second one is the Partnership for Health Systems Improvement, which provides uh, funding of up to $400,000 over three years. And there is a partnership contribution that is also required. Uh, but I'm going to pass it over to Andrea at this point because um, she will be able to give you all the details on the FISI. Thank you. OK, well, I'm, I'll just get started. It looks like um, the, the presentation is loaded up. Thank you very much for the, for, um, the pass off, uh, Elizabeth. And I'll talk to you a little bit more today about our Partnerships for Health System Improvement uh, program here at CIHR. And uh, this is an important tool for ITSI's initiative, I think, and has several unique features that I want to, to outline to you today. Um,
these unique features are what make FISI such a, a, a an effective and powerful tool, but sometimes there can, they can be points of confusion, which I'm hoping I can clarify for you. So with respect to, to FISI as a program in terms of what it is, it really is uh, looking at providing health system decision makers with strong evidence that is relevant to their priority issues and, and needs. So that, that's one of the key focuses. It must be relevant to those decision makers' needs. And this is one of CIHR's integrated knowledge translation programs. So you'll see there's a strong focus on partnerships where researchers and decision makers are working together to conduct relevant health services and policy research. So again, focusing on the, the relevance to the decision maker for this particular funding opportunity, we're looking at a pull focus. So the, the demand here or the interest is coming from the decision maker as opposed to a push focus where the researcher is really coming up with the, the, the focus and the idea and the pertinence for the, for the project itself. So in terms of what's eligible, the scope for this funding opportunity is quite broad. Uh, it is health services and policy research that is applied in nature. So that can be quite broad, and certainly we have plenty of examples of those projects that have been funded already to give you a sense for what this includes. But I'll, I'll provide a, a few examples in a few minutes to, to perhaps give you a sense of what is covered. <laughs> in terms of team compositions, as I said before, uh, there's this close par partnership between researchers and decision makers. So you do have to have a researcher and decision maker that make up the principal applicants for the team um, so that there is a strategic direction being led by both the researcher and decision maker and that that's clear in the application uh, that, of that dual partnership. The length of the grant can be up to three years. So we often see two to three years for these particular projects. And in terms of the sources of funding, <clears throat> again, the, given away in the title of the particular tool, um, this is a strong focus on partnership support. So we provide CIHR provides the majority of the funding from three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollars, and this depends on the province. Uh, so uh, if you're coming from um, British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, Quebec, um, you'll need to get leveraged partner support to the tune of thirty percent of your grant budget, and and for the remaining provinces, that total is twenty percent. Um, so again, this this leveraged partner support and the ratios that go along with that, that can be somewhat confusing, but I'll talk to you a little bit more about that partnership component in just a few minutes. And also being a, a knowledge translation uh, funding opportunity, there is a strong KT focus to this particular tool. So a, a knowledge translation plan is an integral part of the project so that we can see intentions to disseminate or apply the results of the, the research um, depending on what's appropriate for the particular topic in question. On the next slide, we have a few uh, examples of FISI projects that have been funded, and, and this is more sort of br broadly in the pediatrics area, um, and, and certainly uh, draws interest to the fact that we, we don't have many that have been funded at this point, and I, I'd be keen to go to the applications as well. In, in the area of youth and, and child and youth mental health. Um, so I think that's something that it's, it's really important that these sorts of opportunities and webinars are going out to a targeted community of, of researchers and decision makers like yourself, uh, just to indicate that there, there is a gap in this kind of work that's being done and we do want to sort of, we do want to drum up more interest and potential applications from this particular community. So uh, there's also a KT a knowledge translation case book that we've produced um, in the knowledge translation branch here at CIHR that provides a, a lot of other examples of integrated knowledge translation projects similar to FISI and the synthesis tool. And, and this can also give you a good sense for, for what integrated knowledge translation is all about. Um, and this, this um, case book is available on our website, which I'll provide a link to later, later on. On the next slide, um, I don't want to bog down, get bogged down too much with numbers, but I do want to emphasize how, how uh, relevant FISI is as a tool to, to, to achieve funding. Um, you'll see here in the last, uh, the last uh, four or five years of the FISI uh, funding opportunity, you can see what's been received in terms of applications and reviewed what has then been actually approved for funding. And if you look simply at the numbers of what we received in, term, in applications and and then what's been uh, funded, you, you get an average of around 33 to 67% depending on the year, which is, you know, is, is uh, 
sort of in line with a number of, of other funding opportunities, but it, it can look like a little bit of a gamble when you're putting together a lot of work to submit an application. However, when you look at the um, applications submitted versus those applications in the fundable range, so you need to score above 3.5 um, in our evaluation criteria to, to be considered in the fundable range. When you look at those numbers, you're actually looking at a success rate of, for the last several years, 100%. So the bottom line with all of these numbers and, and the point that we want to make is that the success rate for FISI has more to do with the quality of applications coming in rather than the, avail the availability of funds. So it's, it's absolutely worth your while in taking the time to submit a high quality application because the odds of, of receiving funding if you do score within the fundable range are quite high. So, so this is the point we want to make and this is the point behind providing sessions like this one to, to try and help potential applicants understand what, what comprises a strong application. We also, again, recognize the, the, the partnership component of, of the FISI tool is, is a key component of the success of it, and that to build those meaningful partnerships can be very time-consuming and resource-intensive. So in light of this, um, FISI's created a, a partnership development fund um, on our, um, our meetings planning and dissemination grant. So this is a planning grant that we have. We have a FISI priority announcement on that planning grant that provides you with up to 25K um, to, to try and scope out activities to try and uh, build partnerships, all with the intention of applying to a FISI uh, funding opportunity. And the scope of activities can be quite broad. It could be uh, from planning face-to-face -face exchanges with your potential partners. Um, it could be around priority setting for your particular project. Um, and all of these activities are, are, are quite broad and, and well justified, but it must be with the intent to submit an application for the FISI program. On the next slide, I have a couple of key words, and, and I, I think that if you can um, get a strong understanding of these, these terms and words, um, you'll have a good understanding of what's required for a FISI application. So I'm going to, to just touch quickly on, on each of these. So as I've mentioned before, integrated knowledge translation um, is the foundation for this particular FISI funding opportunity. And if you look at the next slide, you'll see a definition that we've created for integrated knowledge translation. And I'm not going to read through the knowledge translation definition, um, but suffice it to say this definition serves as the, the conceptual foundation for all of our KT funding opportunities at CIHR, including the FISI program. And I've included a web link here at the bottom of the slide that it also includes this definition along with a number of other of other slides and resources. And certainly I think if you're if you're serious about looking at submitting for this particular funding opportunity, it's helpful to to reference uh, that site and, and get a little uh, better uh, information about what uh, integrated knowledge translation is and what some of the tools we have available are in helping you to to understand these concepts. Um, so looking specifically at integrated KT, again, this is the, that the understanding that knowledge users are engaged in the entire research process. And, and many will be familiar with this kind of concept um, as it's known by a number of different labels such as collaborative or participatory research. So the knowledge user engagement involvement, it can vary depending on the nature of the project, but at a minimum we, we believe that they should be working together with the researchers to shape the research questions, interpret the findings, and move the results into practice. And this can go as well beyond that kind of involvement to additional activities like deciding on methodology, data collection, dissemination, application, these sorts of things, depending on the intensity required for that particular project. And the benefits of integrated KT is that the research is strengthened and can have more impact because the end users have been involved throughout the research process. They're ready for the results and willing to move the results into practice because they have a direct relevance to them. And so research is answering questions that they've asked in this regard. When we're looking at uh, knowledge users and the definition of this, um, we have a number of different examples here on this next slide. Um, CIHR defines a knowledge user as anyone who's likely to be able to use the knowledge generated from research to make informed decisions about health policies, programs, or practices. Um, this is an official applicant category at CIHR, um, 
and there is a principal knowledge user role and a knowledge user role that you'll see um, is part of the FISI funding opportunity. So these are our categories that we use officially at CIHR, um, and you will become familiar with these as you're applying. <clears throat> so there are some examples here. This isn't an exhaustive list. Um, and the, we recognize the definition is, is pretty broad, but it's up to the applicants who are applying to justify what that particular knowledge user, why they're appropriate for the project in, in question. Are they able to use the knowledge to make informed decisions? Are they committed to applying the findings and so on? Now, so that's the broad definition we use um, at CIHR for knowledge user. With respect to the FISI funding opportunity, you'll see on the next slide, um, we, also, we also reference des decision makers, which are a subset of this knowledge user uh, community. And in the context of the FISI application, it's critical that um, the decision makers have substantive decision making power to be able to put the results of the project into action when that's appropriate. So this decision-making authority should be clearly illustrated in the application. Um, so in, in particularly with, with, um, with the FISI project or FISI funding opportunity, there has to be that um, very clear illustration <clears throat> that the decision-maker involved or the knowledge user involved has the capacity to implement change based on the results of the project. So again, the, the partnerships component is a very key part of this particular funding opportunity. Uh, as I mentioned before, there is a different requirements depending on the province you're, you're submitting from. Uh, so in BC, Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec, we have a requirement to bring in leverage funding for this project of 30% of the overall grant budget. And in the remaining provinces and territories, that's 20%. <laughs> and there are several different uh, ways you could source this leverage partner funding. We have two, two types of partnerships external to CIHR um, that you can seek this 20 to 30 percent funding from. There are competition partners and project-specific partners. So competition partners are partners that have a formal agreement with CIHR through a, an MOU. And uh, typically, these are the provincial health funding agencies, along with some other organizations that have a, a national mandate. And um, <clears throat> these particular organizations have agreed to support um, uh, depending on the, the request from the, the applicant, part of that 20 to 30 percent in cash or in kind. And in most cases, um, you'll have to contact these organizations in advance of the CIHR deadline. Typically, it's six weeks prior to the, the CIHR busy deadline. This will all be outlined in the funding opportunity that will be posted um, in June. Um, all of these details and deadlines, uh, we, when we launch the call in June, will become available within the call. And then the other level, as I mentioned before, are project-specific partners. And these are typically um, organizations or partners that are coming in, uh, often linked to the decision-maker team member. Um, so, so these are sort of uh, informally arranged between the applicants and the organization involved. There is no agreement between that organization and, and CIHR. It's uh, simply a commitment in the form of a, a written commitment and letter of support from the project-specific partners that they will be providing contributions of in kind or financial uh, to, a, to a certain tune. So on the next slide, I have a list of these are some of the competition partners that we had on our competition call for the 2010 FISI competition. So this gives you an idea of some of the organizations involved. And as you'll see, again, as I mentioned before, these are, these are typically provincial funding uh, agencies, so they would be supporting those applications coming in um, from their particular provinces. But we also have had the Mental Health Commission of Canada as a competition partner and Heart and Stroke, so organizations with a national mandate who are looking to support applications coming in that are relevant to their particular mandate. So moving on to how FISI uh, applications are evaluated, um, we, we look at a particular concept called merit review. And you may or may not be familiar that with this. Um, some sort of this cartoon provides a bit of a, uh, a different slant on what the experience is all about. But so we find that at CIHR, for these types of integrated knowledge translation tools, merit review is an ideal way of evaluating, uh, evaluating the, the applications that come in. The panels are composed of researchers and decision makers, and each application is then evaluated by one decision maker and one, uh, one researcher uh, panelist. And both are asked to score, uh, two scores in fact, 
So they're evaluated on the first score, which is for scientific merit, and the second score is for potential impact. So in order to be in the fundable range, you have to score above 3.5 on both of those factors, scientific merit and potential impact. Um, so the potential impact score re reflects the relevance of the project to the decision makers and the likelihood that it will have an impact. And obviously the scientific, mer scientific uh, merit uh, reflects uh, the methodologies, the rigorousness of the, the science involved. And on the next two slides, actually, we have, um, we have the merit review criteria as they are sketched out for the FISIA funding opportunity. And this is included in the, the call that's launched every year. And I'm not going to go through each one, but I, I do want to highlight um, some of those criteria that are specific to potential impact. Because for, for those of you who are applying for the first time to an integrated KT funding opportunity, um, the potential impact uh, scores and criteria may be somewhat new to you. So when you're looking at research question, um, this, uh, this second point of to what extent does the research question respond to immediate, immediate need identified by decision makers, uh, that, is, that is one that's very specific to that potential impact score. So um, I'll, I'll simply highlight those ones and, and they'll become obvious to you. Um, and on the next page, if you look at the, the, the two remaining areas, <clears throat> we have feasibility and outcomes. And if you, you'll see there, then I've highlighted those elements on that screen that, um, that are specific to potential impact scores. So this is your first time, time applying to an integrated KT funding opportunity that uses merit review. I, re I really do recommend that you become familiar with this potential impact criteria to be sure that you're addressing this along with the scientific scientific merit in your proposal. So finally, I just want to highlight some of the key dates for the uh, Partnerships for Health System Improvement uh, pro, uh, funding opportunity that are coming up. Uh, again, it does take time to, to build some of the partnerships that are in place. The, um, the busy development funds that we've created are offered three times a year. There's, there's three opportunities in which you can access a potential uh, funding of $25,000 to help start building those partnerships that, uh, that might help in, in building your, your final FISI application. Um, and to keep in mind that the actual FISI competition itself is launched every year, and it's launched in June. So this year it will be June 2011. And the application deadline for submissions is November 1st. So uh, this is, uh, we, we typically follow this sort of time frame which would allow for evaluation and final decisions to be made and, and uh, made public on April 1st, which is when the funding will be started, is in April 1st of 2012. So it's important to keep these dates in mind um, and recognize that there are several different complex components of the FISI funding opportunity that do require some forward thought in terms of pulling together your, your application and submitting. Uh, that said, we are here for any questions that you have. We recognize that the process can be um, new for some who haven't applied to an integrated knowledge translation program, certainly for decision makers who are involved for the first time. And we have plenty of expertise here to, to help you and support you in, in, in pulling together a strong application. So I'll just wrap it up there. Um, I know there's uh, time dedicated for plenty of questions, and I'd be happy to answer those. I have some contact information here. Of course, obviously, Elizabeth Fowler um, is your, your principal. Um, here at CIHR, uh, Jasmine Lefebvre, who is the strategic lead for FISI, uh, will be happy to answer questions that you have about, about the funding opportunity. Um, specifically questions around uh, the, the strategic element of it, what, what projects fit within the scope of FISI and that sort of thing. Application-specific questions will certainly direct you to the appropriate uh, group to make sure that you're completing all important elements of the application. So I'll wrap it up there and hand it off. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea and Elizabeth. And just before we get to questions, I just wanted to point out uh, what the consortium's involvement has been to date. I mentioned the, uh, the background paper. We were also involved in that workshop in terms of facilitating really a, 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 a cross section of, of stakeholders in child and youth mental health, health to help uh, uh, in the uh, conceptualization of this particular call. Uh, the consortium has a working group that's been tasked to look at this opportunity in, in more detail. And uh, we see 
uh, a number of themes that are going to be relevant to our, our membership. Some of the ones that have come up to date, uh, research on, on uh, system navigation and system navigation tools in terms of child and youth mental health, synthesis of existing data on access and wait times, uh, so it can have a better impact on decision making uh, in, in, uh, in real time. Also looking at, at uh, models of pathways to care, uh, how we actually facilitate the process uh, uh, of receiving care along the full continuum. Uh, those might be issues that people on the call would be interested in. We see the, the consortium as, as playing various roles potentially in this call. One is, is in terms of facilitating communication like the webinar today. We're trying to reach out to those who are already members of the consortium, but those who are not members who may want to become members uh, to, to find out what an opportunity like this uh, actually means and, and where there may be a, a, an opportunity for them as well to partner with the consortium and its members uh, in a particular call. We are considering ourselves as a consortium putting in a, a response to this call, uh, but we also are, are very eager to partner with others who have interest in, in responding. And uh, at times, I think, uh, because of our, of our reach and our membership, we have capacity we, that would strengthen any application. But also, as people approach us and, and through a communication, ongoing communication with our membership, there might be an opportunity to uh, integrate and galvanize certain uh, teams together into a stronger application uh, with much greater reach in terms of impact, uh, especially with, uh, with decision makers. If you are not currently a member of the consortium, at the end of, of, of uh, our webinar, probably at the beginning of next week, we'll be sending out a, an evaluation sheet where we're going to be asking you questions about your experience on this webinar, but also we'll be sending you information about uh, how you can become a member of the consortium so we can keep you in the information loop, share emerging things that are coming up around this, uh, this opportunity, and potentially broker some relationships between some of you to, again, further strengthen some of the applications that might be going uh, to CIHR. So at this point in time, we're going to be opening it up to questions. And uh, the process for this, I, I'm actually going to let Lisa Stromquist speak to that. Lisa is the uh, coordinator for the National Infant, Child, and Youth Mental Health Consortium. And right now, my technological guru, Lisa. Hi. Um, everybody should have a control panel. And in that control panel, you have the ability to raise your hand where I can unmute you and you could ask your question. Or you could type your question um, into the control panel as well, and we can, uh, we can read it out loud and, and address it uh, either through Elizabeth, uh, um, Andrea, or Ian, or anybody else online who might have something to contribute. So we do have some hands raised, um, so I will go ahead and start. I will unmute lines. All right, somebody has uh, typed in a question. Uh, is there consider consideration given to providing equitable funding for each developmental stage of life, i.e., I am interested in zero to five? Um, maybe I'll try answering that one. Um, at the moment, I don't believe we've decided that we're, um, we haven't made any plans to uh, separate the money that we have for this funding opportunity within uh, age ranges. We, we are, um, and, and Andrea can speak to the fizzy, but my understanding is that all uh, grants will be peer reviewed and um, we'll take from the top down. Yeah, I, I, I concur with that, Elizabeth. Um, it really hasn't been, um, uh, from FISI's experience, it's, it's really looking at the applications themselves and, and what the, the committee is, is scoring in terms of uh, ranked ranking, and we go from the top down from there. Okay, I have another question. Will applications that involve partnerships across multiple provinces be favored over ones that are specific to one province? For FISI, um, we absolutely do, do look at the, uh, well, the, the panel, uh, review panel will look at um, scope of impact. So um, if there are multiple jurisdictions that are potentially impacted, that would certainly, um, again, uh, potentially lead to a higher impact, uh, potential impact score. Um, but as well, it could be it could be a study. It has to be also reasonable in terms of what's what's realistically uh, 
you're, you, what realistically you're able to tackle with that project. You might, in your application, identify a specific jurisdiction where you are focusing your efforts, uh, but then we would certainly encourage applicants to, uh, to mention within their application how that might be scoped up to a broader, uh, to, at a broader level. Um, or scoped to other jurisdictions. So certainly in terms of that potential impact score, um, the committee will be looking at where there are other applications. Is this such an isolated impact within one specific area that we can't look at applicability um, to other jurisdictions? Um, it's just an important one to factor. And if, there's, if it's not scopable or if there's limited applicability, then that's fine as well, but there needs to be some mention of it or some justification of it in the application to help the reviewers understand how best to score on potential impact. Uh, this is Ian speaking. I actually have a question. I know that uh, as a previous funding partner for CIHR initiatives where funding is tied to a given province, uh, some provincial funders can only fund projects where the project itself is being undertaken in a given province or the leads are clearly in a given province. Uh, is that consideration going to be extended to this FISI application as well? Uh, yeah, it's important to understand that with FISI, um, there is a similar sort of arrangement, as you can see from the competition partners that we typically have on on board with us. Um, they they will support uh, those projects that are relevant to their mandate, and if they have a provincial mandate, it's usually that the project is um, relevant to uh, relevant to their jurisdiction, or it's that the uh, nominated principal applicant comes from that particular province. And again, that goes to that requirement to 20 to 30 percent. That will also determine um, what, where along that line you'll be contributing. Um, so it is important, but we've had, we've had instances where there have been um, interprovincial projects um, that have that have taken place, and in that case, you potentially will have more than one, one more than one competition partner from a more than one province who is interested in supporting that. So the competition partners certainly aren't closed off to the opportunity to support um, multi-jurisdictional projects, and nor is CIHR. So, in fact, it, 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 from our perspective, that's a, that's a benefit. There are a number of participants on the call today that have asked whether or not the uh, slides from your presentations will be made available, and, and absolutely will make those slides available. Um, uh, Lisa, the best way to do that would be? Uh, well, actually, we've, um, we've taped the presentations, and we will be creating a podcast and posting it on the uh, CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network, and uh, we'll also post the slides separately. And I'll send out a message to uh, let you know, all the participants on the call, to let you know when uh, they've been posted. We've had a bit of a challenge in terms of those of you that are raising your hands uh, to ask questions. If, if we can't get to you, if we can't get to you, then we suggest that you actually type in your question and we'll make sure that we raise it. So I have another question here. It says, stigma is a major issue with access to services for youth. If there are already established partnerships in this area, would there be a potential to use the funding call to build partnerships, uh, to extend or build a broader partnership? Uh, I, I'm, this is Andrea here. I'm going to assume that um, they are speaking uh, specifically about the FISI partnership development funds as opposed to the FISI uh, funding opportunity itself. Um, and certainly, uh, if there are existing partnerships in place uh, around, a, uh, around a certain project or, or interest, um, then if you're looking at using those development funds to build a broader network of partnerships with the intention of, 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 of supporting a strong busy application, then that certainly does fit within the scope of that, that, uh, that particular grant, that, that 25000 that's available for partnership development. But of course, again, in applying um, and submitting an application for that, you have to uh, really be able to justify um, very clearly why that broader partnership is critical to um, the overall project that you're submitting uh, ultimately to FISI. So um, I think that uh, certainly that's within the scope and, and just paying close attention in your application to the relevance and role of those additional partners is what is key. 
Okay, I have another question. Maybe uh, Ian can uh, answer this one. Is the consortium going to apply to FISI funds uh, to create a children's mental health network? That's a great question. I think that the, the consortium is actually our attempt to begin to develop that network uh, on an ongoing basis. We're looking at all opportunities uh, for ways to uh, support and sustain our activities. Uh, and we're giving serious thought to whether the consortium as a lead uh, would be applying to a FISI grant or not, and not just for the sake of a network, but rather to have a focused question uh, that the consortium would be uniquely placed to answer because of our capacity and our and, and our reach. If we are if we're not in a position to be a lead, then we would also look to partner directly with those who are interested in similar questions to the ones that we're interested in, and perhaps some of the funding. Uh, that would be applied for would be to support that network, which might be integral to the undertaking of the research in question. And I guess as a corollary question, I'd ask Elizabeth and Andrea, in, in that regard, if, if uh, the project really depends on the, on the good functioning of a network, uh, can there be lines in a budget that speak to that in terms of supporting the communication across that network for the undertaking of the research? Uh, uh, Elizabeth, feel free to jump in with respect to, to FISI, um, the FISI grant, if there is work that needs to be done in terms of the, the partnership building as, as a fundamental element of the, the, the project or proposal, um, certainly um, there are, there, we'd have to look at the specifics of that, but there is opportunity for eligibility there, but it has to be uh, clearly relevant to the overall um, purpose and success of the project itself that you're proposing. So um, I, I think we'd have to look at that in more detail, but um, it, it, there could be a, a line item in terms of that uh, being an eligible expense, but it would have to be fleshed out a little bit more in detail. Yeah, I mean, my, my, the reason I hesitated was because my initial reaction was that I didn't think so, but I was curious as to Andrea's take on it because um, the, the intent of, of the funding opportunity from, from what we've heard at the workshop and, and what we've worked on so far is, is to have an improvement on access to mental health services, and it really is on access to these services. So if, if the creation of the network is integral to that, then, then probably, but uh, if, if not, then, then I would say no. Yeah. And, and just to add that it's not, not the focus of the project again. So I, I completely agree with, with Elizabeth there that if it's, um, if it's fundamental to achieving the objectives of the, the research uh, project um, and, and doesn't dominate the budget as well, um, then, then I suppose that that would, be, that would be an eligible expense, but it would really have to be well justified and rationalized in the proposal. Now, and your thinking is completely in line with the conversations that have taken place at the consortium where uh, we do not see this as an opportunity in and of itself for the establishment of a network, but we do see where there might be work done by the, co the consortium uh, that can very much answer a focused question that's completely in line with the call and be integral to uh, uh, having the kinds of outcomes that uh, are relevant to the call. So. Uh, if people are, are interested in, in, again, with partnering with the consortium, uh, we would definitely be in a position to, to uh, develop the rationale whereby uh, ongoing communication with the consortium and uh, actual work being undertaken by the consortium uh, could add huge value to any project that's uh, seeking funding. And as an example, I mean, the, the, the consortium was involved in the development of the background paper associated with this call. And that was because of our reach and because of our capacity that we were able to do that. But there was a very clear product that was derived from that that was of value, I think, to CHR, uh, but also, I, I think, to uh, uh, the, the research community at large. Yeah. And can I just add, too, um, I did mention the knowledge translation uh, plan as part of the FISI project um, and the application itself, and, and the network could fit as well into that, um, into that element of the, uh, the proposal or project with respect to the dissemination of the results or, or using the network to help with application. 
answer, and I was just going to say that that background paper has been helpful for us in helping refine the objectives and parameters of, uh, of the funding opportunity. And also we um, hope to uh, that the people who apply will, will use it as a resource. So we're going to uh, post a link uh, from the funding opportunity to that background paper. As, uh, and, and just to remind people that that background paper is on the CHR website, uh, on the ITSI website, it's also on the CAFC website. Uh, and if people are having any trouble finding it at all, they can contact us at the uh, consortium. We can be available to them as well. Perfect. Any questions? Yeah, I have some more questions. Uh, can you elaborate more about the Strategic Initiatives Funds Group with the CHR versus the open competition? We're not sure what the, requir what the requirements are to access this pot of money. Uh, so, um, yeah, so the... The strategic initiatives, um, it's, it's just a, a way of describing how CIHR funds research. Open competition is you, you the, the applications are, are fairly open. You don't have to put parameters around them. The strategic funding opportunities are ones like this mental health services. They're, they're initiatives that are uh, initiated by the institutes and they have um, specific objectives and guidelines and so your applications have to fit in with these objectives and guidelines. So um, any of the um, RFAs that you see on the website that are uh, specific to an institute or that have these, these guidelines and objectives around them are a strategic initiative and so to access these funds you have to apply to them. So ITSI, for example, uh, in January launched uh, an RFA on the secondary analysis of uh, health databases. Uh, so that how you would access those funds would be to apply for that uh, particular strategic initiative. Sorry if that wasn't clear in my presentation. Okay. Um, I have another question. How can those on the webinar know what the questions of interest to the consortium that Ian spoke about are? And also, how, as a decision maker, uh, have impact on those questions? Uh, good question. Well, first of all, the, through membership in the consortium, anyone can be part of any of these working groups. So I'm thinking, if I'm not mistaken, that's Kathy who's asking that question. Uh, welcome to join the consortium, and, and if you want to have an impact on, on our thinking in this regard, we would absolutely invite you to participate. Uh, I think that uh, because we the consortium has been involved in the uh, initial workshop and developed the background paper, where the insights from decision makers were already there and our ongoing conversations with decision makers, I think some of those are, are reflected in the theme areas that we're starting to identify. Our conversations are very preliminary, but I mentioned before we there are three theme areas that we, we've had in our preliminary discussions, those of, of uh, system navigation, system navigation tools, uh, looking at the existing, where are the existing data sets uh, that are available right now and how can they be better used in terms of, of answering policy questions even directing through the research. And the last would be pathways to care, specific strategies and models in terms of whether it's emergency care or community-based care uh, that might have a direct impact uh, on access and wait times. There's one extra theme that's emerging uh, in the consortium. It hasn't uh, been discussed at length uh, in uh, the um, uh, access and wait times working group, but it has been discussed at the executive and has also been discussed as we're developing a theme for our next national symposium. And that's the role of school-based mental health and its impact on access and wait times, both in terms of looking at universal programming within schools that can decrease the demands uh, on the more specialized, uh, whether the community-based or, or, or specialized service providers, uh, and the importance of mental health literacy in that respect, early identification that can also have a huge impact on the streaming of of those in need to the appropriate resource. So school-based mental health is another theme that I think there'd be some interest in the consortium partnering on. Next question. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, can you speak more to the call, we not individual outcomes for clients, but more focus on the systems challenge? Change, sir. That's from Laura Rogers. Can you speak more to the call regarding not individual outcomes for clients, but uh, more focus on the systems change? Okay. Uh, so the, the intention of, of this call was really to, to attempt to have an impact on health services delivery. So um, um, mental health services, I mean, it, it can be 
we're hoping that people won't suggest uh, app or won't put in applications that are suggesting the investigation of uh, a new drug, for example, or a new type of therapy. What we're hoping to look for are models of provision of care and the service delivery uh, aspect of the care rather than individual treatments. Um, does, does that clarify it? I think, I mean, from my understanding of this question, we're, we're, uh, is it more systemic outcomes or individual outcomes? And, and it's actually both. And the, the, uh, it is. I mean, ultimately, hopefully with the health, improvements in access to care, then the individual outcomes will be, will be ameliorated, obviously. But, but it, the, the, the call really is focused on, on the system as, um, and health services as opposed to individual care. And Laura has acknowledged that you've actually answered her question. So great. Okay. <laughs> okay, I have another comment and a question. Uh, so thanks for providing this call. It's very helpful. And I'm wondering if there will be opportunity for funding partnerships across funding silos, example, programs for mental health within the schools and under the purview of the Ministry of Education. Absolutely, actually. And that was one of our hopes was that given that the fact that uh, mental health services are so multidisciplinary and provided in such a wide gamut of places, then yes, we absolutely encourage um, different across jurisdictions, across uh, systems. Uh, next week I'm going to Ontario and they've, there I'm going to be speaking to the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, and the Ministry of Child and Youth Services because they're hoping to, to work on something together. So yes. And ju just to add to that, uh, Elizabeth, uh, we have also been working with uh, in Ontario, definitely with those three ministries. But even the representation, the consortium is is cross sectoral in nature, and we have linkages to researchers and uh, service providers and policymakers across a variety of different sectors. So we might be in a position to facilitate some of that cross sectoral work as well. So I'm looking at the, the question list. There are some people that have put their hands up but haven't necessarily been able to get through uh, in terms of uh, a verbal question. And those that are, that are currently having their hands up, if you want to type in your questions, we'll make sure that we uh, present them to the panel. Uh, we're not having luck with uh, unmuting your lines to be able to have you ask the question directly. So right now, again, we have, we have some time left and we still have uh, room for some questions. So anyone who has an outstanding question, please feel free to type it in. I can add a question. We actually had a question before the uh, webinar started, and this is from a researcher in, in Western Canada, and they have been involved in, in access and wait times research for great, quite a, deal, a great deal of time. Uh, and they have amassed quite a significant data set. And they were curious to what extent uh, the call would be amenable to secondary analysis of existing data sets. <laughs> Well, I think they should apply to the call that's out right now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, on, on secondary analysis. Um, I, I think, um, and Andrea, maybe you can add, add, uh, add your input as well, but if the, if, if the secondary analysis of data set meets the call objectives, if the, what they're proposing within the secondary analysis meets the objectives, then, then I, would, I would think, yes, it would be applicable. Great, so we'll pass that along. Uh, again, anyone else that hasn't been able to get on the line, please type in your response, your question, I should say. I don't know if Martine Flamand is still on the line or not. I know she had a question. So if she wanted to type that in, we can make sure that we have the panel address it. So, so it looks like we might be getting near the end in terms of people's uh, informational needs right now. And uh, I think it would, you've been very clear. And if people have questions offline, you've provided the contact information uh, of key players at CHR. So we, we very much appreciate that. And just a reminder to folks again uh, that uh, we will be following up with each and every one of you uh, with an evaluation of the webinar. One thing we're going to be asking, actually, we know how many people have signed up, and we know how many people have been on the line. What we don't know is how many people might be sitting together in a room as you're doing this. We're trying to get a sense of a head count for actual participants. Uh, as I mentioned, it's well over 100, but it might be more than that if you have two or three people sitting in a room at the same time. So, so please, we hope that you'll answer that. Uh, we're also going to be asking you about 
uh, other webinar topics that you might be interested in uh, because uh, we uh, at the consortium uh, are viewing our role in communication as being a very significant one and we want to be able to have meaningful conversations on an ongoing basis on topics of high relevance to the key stakeholders uh, around the country. Uh, so please don't hesitate to give us uh, uh, comments about uh, the kinds of things you'd like to hear or if you have a piece of information that you'd like to share and potentially be a person that would be a presenter on a webinar, you could take the opportunity, the evaluation to, to share that with us and we would keep you on our roster as someone down the road uh, that could be uh, helping us in, in presenting a, a webinar. Uh, also, I want to just remind people that uh, with the evaluation, we'll be sending out information about how you can become a member of the consortium. Uh, the consortium is, is a, a very uh, open forum. At this point in time, there are no membership fees. Uh, we are running primarily on the goodwill and in-kind contributions of our various members. Of course, uh, we are looking uh, at all times to find ways uh, to financially support our efforts so we can increase our scope and the support that we're providing our members. At this point in time, we're trying to engage as many uh, stakeholders as possible. Uh, regardless of what sector you're in, regardless of what role you have, uh, we believe that having one forum where everyone that has interest in child and youth mental health can convene to have meaningful conversations is the only way that we're actually going to continue to keep this on the, everyone's radar and, and not just talk about things, but actually make significant change. So I'm going to make one more check in terms of our list of questions. I don't see any additional questions at this time. Uh, on behalf of the consortium, uh, I would truly like to thank uh, Andrea and Elizabeth for your contributions today, your, your, your time. And I know that you've also uh, put time and effort into preparing for today and even practicing the technology be behind the scenes. So we definitely appreciate that. Uh, and we also are, are uh, very uh, appreciative for everyone that has joined the call today and, and has stayed on the call. And as I'm talking, I see another question has come up. I'm just going to read it for <laughs> folks. Is the consortium purely interested in pediatrics or would transition into adult services be a topic? Uh, we, uh, that is a, a very good question. I know that uh, some of the stakeholders in the consortium right now are doing uh, very significant work in transition to adult care. And uh, it's a, a very hot topic that's been raised by many of our stakeholders. Uh, I don't think that we are so narrow as to only look at pediatrics. Uh, the link between pediatric and adult care is, is a significant one. So if, if, if uh, um, individuals are interested in that topic, what we could definitely do is link you up to some of our partners, some of our members that are currently engaged in research in this area uh, to facilitate communication. I hope that answers your, quest your question, Crystal. So any more questions before we sign off? I would just like to thank the consortium very much and CAPSI as well for helping us promote this initiative. Uh, we really appreciate the exposure and, and the interest and the support. You are very welcome. <laughs> That's the uh, dulcet tones of Elaine Orbein who's sitting in another room listening to us. It's, uh, again, this is a, a wonderful partnership. Uh, CAFC is a member of the consortium and has provided tremendous support for our activities as a fledging network of networks, so to speak. Um, one of our challenges right now is that the consortium is, is actually exploding in terms of the work that we're being asked to do and the opportunities we're being presented with. So uh, the, more, the, the more involved, the more hands make lighter work, and we're really encouraging people to get involved at all levels in the work of the consortium. Uh, we certainly hope that many of you will be uh, applying to uh, these opportunities. I think uh, it will be a true test of our ability to mobilize the, the stakeholders if uh, CHR sees that uh, people are interested in this topic and actually are committed to some meaningful work in the area. So uh, have a good weekend to all. And one last thank you is to Elisa Stromquist, uh, coordinator for the National Infant Child and Youth Mental Health uh, Consortium. Uh, she's done all the legwork behind today and, and has uh, really done an excellent job in, in, in getting you all organized so that uh, this can be a good learning opportunity. Thanks, Lisa.